we come to our series in 1 John, we come to 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 10 tonight. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. So if you would turn there with me. First John 1 verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Well, I don't know how many of you have had, have had the opportunity to be in total darkness. Uh, darkness... Uh, that they describe as being able to be felt. I remember one time when we were vacationing very early on in our marriage in California, we went to an abandoned gold mine, and they <clears throat> let us into this gold mine. They had lights along the top of the tunnel. You walk in, and you walk in, in a good bit, and you turn the corner, and they turn off the lights, and you cannot see a thing. It is complete darkness. Now that is the condition of our hearts. That's how dark our hearts are. There's no way that we can find our way around in any sort of sense without light penetrating into the darkness. Now, what they do when they have you in this cave, this abandoned hole, they turn off all the lights and it's pitch dark, and all you need to do is just have a little pin of light, maybe a, a tiny little flat wire, or if you strike a match, and that already uh, begins to dispel the darkness because darkness cannot overcome the presence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. And when we think of our hearts, we can think of it along those same lines. And that's what the Apostle John is trying to do. He's trying to help us see how darkness is dispelled in our hearts. How, how the darkness of our hearts is, is chased away. And he's doing that in order to answer the question of how we can have assurance. That is the theme that runs through this letter in broad strokes. And so it will be a theme that we will see coming back time and time again as we look through the different passages of Scripture in this particular letter. So we're going to look at verses 5 through 10 today. We're going to look at it in two parts again. A light and darkness first and foremost in verses 5 through 7. Then we're going to look at sin and forgiveness in verses 8 through 10. So light and darkness in verses 5 through 7, sin and forgiveness in verses 8 through 10. So what we look at, first of all, in verse 5, is a summary statement. John announces that this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. It's almost like you could put a call in there. This is the message, the summary, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I want us to know, first of all, that again, although John is not mentioned by name in this letter, we are dealing with somebody who is an eyewitness, is an argument. It says this is a message that we have heard from him. Uh, he heard it with his own ears. It speaks uh, to the eyewitness uh, account that John has access to. He's written that in his gospel. But here he's speaking of that next step as we have seen. The, the, the gospel of John written that people would have faith. Uh, the letter of John written that people would have assurance. And what he says as a central uh, message that has been communicated to him by the Holy Spirit is that God is light. And he is certainly not anything to do with darkness. Now, I want us to think a little bit about what it means when John talks about light. Because uh, what does that mean, light in the Bible? What, what kind of ways does the Bible use light? And how does it help 
uh, form our understanding of what John may be discussing in this chapter. So now, we just finished a creation conference, and when we were introduced to life, to life in the Bible, it, it happened right at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and the first thing that God created on the first day is that God created light. He created it even before the sun, which comes on the fourth day. It's the first slave of God bringing order into that which is simply chaotic at first. God uh, begins by creating light, that there would be things to be seen. So God creates this light in the first place. He makes it. In Exodus chapter 13, as we see Israel leading, being led out of Egypt, uh, one of the ways that God leads his people is through a pillar of fire. The pillar of fire is there, it says in Exodus 13, 21, that they would be able to travel both in the daytime when there is the sun as a source of light, but also at the night, that through the pillar of fire, there would be light for the Israelites to travel should that be necessary. Now, the psalmist also speaks of light in several different places. So, for example, in Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We go a couple of psalms further on. In Psalm 36 and verse 9 it says, For you, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. And again, a little bit later on in, in Psalm 119, that, that great psalm uh, about the law of God in verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It doesn't give us all the answers about what light is, specifically in what John is talking about in his letter, but it's starting to take shape for us, isn't it? It's speaking of God's order, it's speaking of His power, it's speaking of His illumination in our life, in our lives, the, the light being penetrated into the darkness of our own hearts. But I want us to look also at John's Gospel in John chapter 8 and verse 12. It says something else about light. Again, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is, again, something that describes the Messiah. It is an accumulation of verses that speak of light that give us some kind of a picture of what John may be talking about. So, in terms of clarity, in terms of light and its function, we see it, first of all, in terms of establishing order in creation. We see it uh, that God gives it to Israel as a, a practical uh, step, or a practical tool in the desert. Maybe uh, in terms of a, a picture for us, understand how it works in our own hearts too. But He gives them light in the desert through a fire that they would be able to walk, that they would be able to not uh, stumble. It says that God gives us His Word, that we could live obediently by His Word, that we would not uh, live in darkness, meaning apart from His Word, but that by studying and reading the Word of God, uh, we would know how to walk. Walking not only in the sense of uh, moral living, although that certainly is included in it, but light also in terms of seeing where the light of life can be found in Christ Jesus alone. And that the offer of salvation comes to us through Him. And that apart from Him, there is only darkness. That is what we are talking about when it says that God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. Not a, not a little bit of darkness in God, but not a single bit of darkness in God. That's what our passage says to us. And so what God gives us by His Word is the light of Christ, that we would know redemption, and that we would know regeneration, that we would know the renewal as we have seen uh, in other places. And so that's what we're talking about when it says that God is light. It, it, it speaks of His, his clarity, uh, that the, the light which flows uh, from God into our hearts uh, clarifies. It shows us our need for a Savior. It shows us how we are to live from day to day also. Now, there is also that counterbalance of darkness, which is discussed in our passage. It says that, it, that God is light, and there is no darkness in Him at all. And I want us again to look at Genesis chapter 1, 
And in verse 2 this time, as we think of the meaning of darkness. Uh, before there is any order in the world, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. It is the darkness of confusion recorded in verse 2 of Genesis that is dispelled in verse 3 of Genesis. It's dispelled by the light. So God has not this confusion. He has not uh, this uh, lack of order. It is dispelled by His creative work. There are other places where we can see how God uses a darkness to describe what is happening in the human condition. And we can go to a place like Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 28 and 29. This is one of the places where, where the blessings and curses of the Israelites are given. Blessings if they live according to the covenant of God. Curses if they live contrary to the covenant of God. And it says there in verse 28, The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. You shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. That which is described of Israel and its unfaithfulness cannot be described of God in any sense. Uh, there is no unclarity in God. For God uh, to be groping around is to say that He is not God. And that is the condition of man. We need to be delivered from it by Him. Uh, but God does not, so, uh, is not subject to that same, uh, that same lack of clarity. I think there are, uh, there are other places where we can look. Psalm, uh, Proverbs chapter 12 and 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. Where it's speaking of uh, the life of, of, of the, the young man in terms of the pursuit of wisdom. And I think we have to start in verse 9 just to give some continuity to the sentence. He's speaking to the young man of the value of wisdom. He says, Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Uh, there is an opposite given here. Uh, the path of uprightness contrasted with the path of darkness. Men of perverse speech walk in darkness. Uh, men of uprightness do not. And that is uh, another way of understanding the contrast between light and darkness and the darkness of our own heart. And I want us to look at one more place in the book of Amos, the prophecy of Amos, where he's speaking of the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It is a, a, a day where the enemies of God are called to reckoning and in this reckoning, there is inscription given. It says, Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? And the day of judgment for the Lord on those who have rejected Him is a day of darkness. A day, uh, how is it described in the, the Gospels? A day of weeping and gnashing of teeth. A day of great sorrow. Now that is the condition of the unbelief. That is the natural condition of our own heart also. And so John here speaks of the message that he hears from the Spirit, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Now, why are we talking about all this light and darkness containing our own hearts when in this passage he's speaking of what is true of God? Well, he picks that up in verse 6. What does he even say in verse 6? He says that if we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. He comes, he comes back to fellowship. You, re you remember that word, uh, fellowship. We, we talked about it. It's not, it's not having lunch together. Although we could be having lunch together. But fellowship being uh, those mutual interests, that sharing that is part of those who are of the family of the faith. If we truly have fellowship with God, that means that we truly have common interests, mutual interests with God. Our interests will not be in the things that oppose God. The things that are opposed to God in our passages that we've looked at have been described as darkness. We, we will not have those interests. Uh, because the Holy Spirit's work in our own hearts. So we will not uh, do the things that oppose God, nor uh, are opposed by Him. 
It becomes one of the tests for the Christian to walk through, to see uh, whether or not he has a true fellowship with God, whether or not, uh, another way to say it is that he has agreement with God when it comes to the things that he believes, the things that he holds to be dear. And so for those of us who are, are here this evening, it causes us to think, what, what are God's interests? Well, one of God's interests, and I can't list them all, but one of God's interests is purity. And therefore, purity, if we have fellowship with God, purity will be what characterizes our entertainment. It will be what characterizes our thoughts. It will be what characterizes the way we speak to one another. Another one of God's interests is, is truth. If we have true fellowship with God, uh, He pursues, He is true, and that is going to be a mutual interest of ours. We are also going to be in pursuit of truth in His Word, and to be honest in our speaking. Another interest of God is His mercy. Uh, we will be merciful towards those who are around us if we also have true fellowship with Him. We will have a common interest. Now, another way to look at these things is to, to say them in the opposite direction. The Christian who surrounds himself with worldliness, with the pursuit of the things of this world, is not sharing, is not having a mutual interest in the same things that God has. Or if we never read our Bibles, we are not having a mutual interest in truth. We are not walking in light in those particular moments. If, if we are dishonest in our relationships or in our words, if we, if we do those things, in those moments we are not having fellowship with God. We are walking in darkness. We are not walking in light in those particular moments. And so what John is saying to you, uh, if your actions deny your words, uh, how does he say it? What's his, his winsome phrase here in, in, our, in our verse? He calls us liars, doesn't he? If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We lie and we do not practice the truth. Your actions, John is saying, your actions confirm your words. You, you can say uh, that, that you have fellowship with God all you want, but your actions could very well will lie uh, what is at the core of your being. Now, when our actions align with our words, we show ourselves to have fellowship. That's what we're talking about in verse 7. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship uh, with one another. And it comes with that realization that He points out, the rescue of our heart from the guilt of sin through the blood of Jesus, His Son. It is when we come and we say to God, Your will be done. That is when we know we have fellowship with Him. Because our thoughts, our interests are in the things that God is interested in. And so action and word must come together. But what is the problem? The problem is that so often we have kind of a, a false relationship in these different ways. And it can be, for example, found in something like a false repentance. Uh, we say we want to have fellowship with God, but in our weaknesses we hold on to our sin. Maybe we have seen it in, in some setting or another where there has been a conflict and in an effort to restore, uh, there, are, there, are, there is a false confession that, that is made. A, a false confession just to try and to deal with the problem so that we can move on. Now, how do we realize that it is false? Well, quite often when the confession, the attempt to restore is false, and the person goes right back to that which they had done before. Um, they don't turn towards light, but they turn back to darkness. That is uh, often what happens. So, uh, you know, you, you seek your wife's forgiveness, husband, and then you walk out the door and you slam. Right? That's false repentance. That's not, it's not walking in the light. It is not living according to uh, the Word of God. Or if you have two of your children who have maybe have had a, a spat and, and you bring them and you say, no, you need to ask your brother for forgiveness. And he says, will you forgive me? And he walks up and he kicks the dog. 
That's not true repentance. That's continually walking in the darkness. Instead, we are called to walk in the light. And when we walk in the light, we have true fellowship with God, with one another, and moving on towards God, as is said in the first four verses of this letter. Now, the question becomes, how can we live to such a standard? Doesn't that become the question of I hope that's the question that's arisen in your heart, because as you read through this, these verses, when I read through these verses, that certainly is something that arises in my mind. How can I, who by my actions so often prove myself to be a liar, how can I have any sense of assurance, how can I have any sense of comfort uh, in when it comes to walking in darkness and walking in light? And it is as if John anticipates it. And so when we turn the corner and talk about sin and forgiveness, it's the solution to the, problem, to the problem of light and darkness that exists in every single one of us. So he turns in verse 8, and he, uh, anticipating our complaint, or maybe our cry, he develops his thought a little bit more, and he says, if we say we have no sin. It flows from what has gone before, doesn't it? Because what would be the temptation if John is writing to us and he says, Jeff, if you walk in darkness, you are a liar. It is only when you walk in the light that you have fellowship with God. What am I going to want to say? Oh yeah, I walk in the light. Don't worry, I walk in the light. It is uh, that motivation to justify yourself, which we see so often in, in the pages of the New Testament, and, and in the Old Testament for that matter. That is this desire uh, to think that we have arrived so that we can have fellowship with God. But John is saying to us here, if we say we have no sin, now there's something that I want us to notice about that little phrase. If we say we have no sin. Is John saying, if you say that you have never sinned in the past? Is John saying, if you say that you have never sinned in the future, that you will never sin in the future? No, to both of those. He is saying, if you right now say that you have no sin, have, present tense, if you say you have no sin, what does he say to us? He says that we're deceiving ourselves and that the truth is not in us. Sin for us is not something of the past. It is not something of the future. It certainly is both of those things. But it's also something of the present. It's something that we deal with every day. It's an action occurring in the present. So, if you say you don't have any sin right now, then you are one who is deceived. Why does he say that? Because the denial of sin is a denial of the reality of who God says that we are in His Word. Uh, look at what happens after the ark when God makes an observation of the condition of man's heart. It's wicked, it says. In Romans chapter 3, when he gives us a description of the condition of man's heart, what does he say of it? He says, it is wicked. What does the prophet Jeremiah say about our heart? It is wicked. Uh, if we say we are without sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Because like we saw this morning, uh, the Almighty God, all-knowing God, has declared something in His Word. And for us to say something that is opposed to it is folly of the greatest degree. When Adam introduced sin into this world uh, through the fall, it was not a temporary setback for the world. It is something that will last until its effects are reversed in its finality. Uh, sin is an unescapable reality for all, for all of us. It is always with us, and it will be abolished only in the second coming. When Christ comes again, the effects of sin are reversed, and we are glorified, and so our salvation is consummated, so to speak. We have forgiveness now, but we still struggle with sin. That sin will not be removed from us until Christ comes again in glory. But he doesn't leave us there with all this talk of deception and lying. I think here in verse 9, what we find in this letter is one of the most comforting words, uh, verses in all of Scripture. It is that famous verse that, that alleviates all our fears, doesn't it? 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Darkness and light, sin and forgiveness, the two come together to offer hope for the believer because all of us walk in the darkness from time to time. All of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. But here, and here in this verse, all mankind is addressed. All mankind is addressed of the only solution that, that, that provides that light into their darkened hearts. That, that mass that struck in that cave when darkness can be felt. That, that flashlight that, that your son was carrying along. And he lights it up in that cave. And finally, as you can see, this is the verse. Now, this is the verse that shows the solution uh, to what we are facing from day to day. That, that great discouragement, that great dilemma that is ours because of our sin. And this verse simply says, if you would confess your sin to God, He will forgive. That is the word of God to us. Now that, that verse involves two parts. The first is understanding that there is a need for forgiveness from God. And so we are reminded that there is only place, one place where we can turn. We will turn to God and because we, the second realization is, that we have transgressed. We have done that which is sinful. We have done that which is evil in His sight. And if you will do that, it says God is faithful. Faithful as He was to Adam. Faithful as He was to Noah. Faithful as He was to Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, to Joseph, to David, to all the saints that have walked this plan from the day of the fall until the present and also into the future. If we confess our sins to God, that is His vehicle through which He delivers His blessing uh, forgiveness. And if God is described to be two things in this verse. He is described to be faithful and He is described to be just. His word, His promise has been kept unbroken. Has God had enough excuses to be able to say, you people are stiff-necked? I think He's actually maybe have said that from time to time. You people are stiff-necked and you are a rebellious people. But does God walk away from His promise? Does God therefore say, I wash my hands of you? No. He says, I will be faithful even when you are faithless. Abraham's family, for example, made it to a great age and all the families of the earth were blessed through him. We've seen enough of Abraham to know that he wasn't an exemplary fellow in many different ways. He wasn't. He was flawed. He was sinful. He was broken. He turned away from God in many different circumstances. But God is faithful, and God is just. The divine justice was satisfied for our sins. They, in fact, were laid on another, so that we don't have to pity that day anymore. We know the name of the man on whom these were laid. Jesus Christ, the one who came in the flesh, so that we would be forgiven in the sight of God. Here we have a summary of God's forgiveness, a summary of of the assurance that is the believer. God is both faithful and just. He is faithful to His promise that we would stand in Him in glory. He is just to remove the guilt of our sin and place them on another so that divine justice can be satisfied. So when we think of all, all this, this, this verse, this great verse of hope and deliverance that if we confess our sins, to God, that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there are several things that I think we can we can learn from it. Uh, first of all, it seems to be a fairly obvious one, but I'll say it anyways, that we are to confess our sins to God. That we are to come to God uh, in prayer confessing our sins. And that becomes a question for us to ask ourselves. How often do I confess my sins? How serious am I in my confession of sin in prayer? And do I take that seriously? Or is that something that I just pass over so that I can get to supplications? Is that what I do in my prayer? Or am I serious to say, Lord God, you call me to confess my sins to you? Are your prayers well balanced? It is an important question to ask 
we looked at it a little bit uh, last Wednesday again in looking at the acronym of Acts, of Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication, that all four of those things ought to be part of our prayers. And the second thing that we're dealing with here is confession. If we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Sometimes when we examine our own prayers and we see a lack of confession in our prayer, maybe maybe we we pray, Lord, forgive us our sins in a very generic way and move on by right? that. And that can speak of our apathy that we have towards the wrong that we have done towards a pure and righteous God. And so we ought to examine ourselves and, and see that we understand the significance of confessing our sins, our specific sins, uh, to God. We, we talked about this on Wednesday too, that when we hold back from a confession of a specific sin, it's not like we're pulling the wall over God's eyes. It's not like we're fooling him. It's, like, it's not like he doesn't know what we've done now. He, he knows our heart. He sees all that we do. But he calls us to confess our sins to you. Uh, to him. And then second of all, we see also, I think something that we can learn from this is that there ought to be a joy and liberation from guilt in our, our confession. We're reminded of the forgiveness that is ours. If we confess, we are forgiven. And there ought to be tremendous joy that comes with that because we're reminded that we're not free from our guilt because of our works, but we are free from our guilt because of God. If we confess our sins to God, and He does the work of forgiveness, why do we even want to confess our sins to God? Because He has changed our hearts. He has done that work in us, and there ought to be a joy in us as we're reminded that there is a liberation from guilt in our confession to God. And then, I think the third thing that we can pick up from this is that we have to have confidence in our confession. That our, that our sins are not greater than the forgiveness that God offers in Christ. I, I hear that sometimes in my own heart. You know, Lord, I've done it again. Uh, you can't possibly forgive me this time. This time, I'm just too bad for your, for your forgiveness. What a statement of pride. Right? Is it not? Uh, everybody else can be forgiven, but my sins, Lord, my sins are really bad. You can't deal with me. But the forgiveness that God offers to us in Christ Jesus is greater than any sin. It's greater than any sin. Uh, Say one, which is the denial of His name, right? We see it in, in, the, in the New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul, writer of most of the New Testament, he was a, a persecutor of the church, a murderer of women and children. And yet, he was the instrument that God used to establish His church in so many different places. So, uh, when we come to this verse, verse 9, such a beautiful, significant verse, it has several things to say to us, and I mentioned only three of them, but uh, we, are, we would do well to meditate on this verse regularly. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then we come to verse 10. Verse 10, uh, in many ways, is a repetition of, of verse 8. Uh, it is the assurance uh, confirmed uh, in us that in the midst of our sin there is forgiveness. Forgiveness which comes in verse 7 we have learned that this comes through the blood of Christ. Uh, even when we yield to darkness, even when we give way to our sin, uh, there is still forgiveness for us. If we say we have not sinned, we may again alight. All of us here we should never pretend that we are without sin. There are no perfect people in God's church. That's in case you hadn't noticed that yet. There are no perfect families. There are no perfect couples. There are uh, no per perfect grandparent-grandchild relationships. And we are all tainted by sin. But the assurance for us is that even though that sin is a reality for us, that there is forgiveness available in the blood of Christ. When we yield to darkness, there is light from the sun. He is our deliverer. We strive, certainly. We strive. But we don't strive apart from the position of the security that has been purchased for us by the blood of Christ. We strive from a starting point. We don't strive toward the goal. The goal being to forgive us. We strive because we have forgiven, been forgiven, not so that we will be. Forgive. So, and what is this passage telling us today in summary? 
And it speaks to us of the, the condition of our hearts, how it is manifested in our actions. It asks us the question whether or not we have fellowship with God. And if we look at our life, do we have mutual interest with Him? Can we say that we have true fellowship with Him? Do we share in His interest? Do we call good what He calls good? And then there is that hope and that joy that is part of this passage. Because it acknowledges for us that we will not do these things perfectly. That we will walk in darkness from time to time. Groping along as if there is no, and no one or anything to guide us. And in those moments, we are denying, we are deceiving, we are lying of the God who has saved us. So we don't pretend to do so perfectly. If we claim to do so, we are liars. But at the root of it all, the beauty of this passage, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I want to read it again for us as we conclude. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray for you.